So this morning, the last time I preached, I, I just really enjoyed my time studying Abraham. And I'm just going to continue in that vein. So if you will turn to Genesis chapter 22. We're going to kind of survey this chapter this morning in hopes of mining out what I believe to be one of the richest sections of Scripture to prepare our hearts for the Lord's table. And so let, let's go to God in prayer and just ask Him to open up our minds and, and our hearts fresh to the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ and His perfect sacrifice on our behalf. What, what is in Genesis 22 is beautiful, and I'm just praying that we will behold it together and then we'll remember uh, at the Lord's table at the conclusion of our service. So let's pray. Father, we come before You and we are grateful for the gospel of salvation. We are grateful for the giving of your son. Lord, we are grateful that you have opened our eyes to see him as a treasure hidden in a field. And God, we were willing to sell all that we have that we might have Christ. I thank you that he's eclipsed uh, all the things that we once held dear, the things that we once thought were life, the things that were our idols. God, you, you've eclipsed them all with the radiance of your glory. I thank you for your spirit who has revealed that sweet Christ to our minds and hearts and affections. And so, Lord, we uh, glory in Christ Jesus. We, we love him. Uh, we do not see him now, but we, we believe and we, we love him. And I thank you for this sweet Savior. And I pray this morning that you will put him on display. God, that Genesis 22 has a portrait of this sweet Savior that I pray we would gaze upon and love and treasure together as we remember what our blessed hope is, what unifies us as one in the body of Christ. So please be with us, Lord. Meet us in a special way in the Word of God this morning. Amen. <coughs> Genesis 22, the setting. We saw uh, two weeks ago that God called Abram, who would later be called Abraham, to come out and, and follow God and that he would bless him. And Abraham believed and he obeyed God. And like always, there became some obstacles and difficulties in following the Lord by faith. There were some failures where he said that his wife was his sister, and we saw a few of them in Genesis. There's some doubt in seeing how will God fulfill this promise that he made to me. Abraham tried to help God out a couple of times. He tried Ishmael, and we just seen a few things in Genesis as well. And so there, there was a faith and a trust in this man all the time. And what I love is, is to watch really how God works in someone's life. And you can just see their growth. And, and I, I think a little later in Genesis with Jacob, he was the, the, the deceiver and twisting and always manipulating. And he becomes such a beautiful example of faith. He wrestles with God that night and he's never really the same and Abraham as well, as we, we saw a little bit of doubt, or maybe we'll call it confusion, in Genesis 15. And we now kind of see the aged Abraham in chapter 22, and he's growing in his faith. The, the test that's going to come in this chapter, Abraham's going to pass with flying colors. We don't see any of the past struggles or doubts or, or sin in this chapter. And this is what I hope is happening to all of us. As we keep growing and seeing the outworking of the faithfulness of God, that, that there's an utter trustworthiness to our God. We walk with God and we learn Him and we learn His ways and we're just maturing and growing in this discernment. We have a growing faith and a growing trust. It's deepening. I hope that every one of you can see this in your life, that, that I'm growing and these things are happening and I'm through the hard times of life, I'm growing in my trust and my ability to know how to just look when everything preaches against what I see, that there's a God who I trust and I'm watching Him unfold my life. And so we have seen some beautiful things from Abraham in Genesis. He trusted God at His bare word. He believed the Lord. That he would bless him from his seed. And all the nations of the world would be blessed. And we have the land promise and future and so many beautiful things to this Abrahamic promise. <coughs> Excuse me. Last time was the high point. It was Genesis 15, 6. That God took and showed Abraham the stars. And he said, so your descendants will be. 
And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That is the gospel right there. Abraham believed God, and this righteousness was put to his account, and God declares him righteous by faith, and he becomes the father of faith. Well, now Abraham has seen the miraculous answer to God's promise. He, he, he's, he's held the fulfillment. The child was born to him at 100 years old. The child that God had specifically told him, it was through Isaac that I will bless the nations. And now he has that treasured, miraculous son who comes to him at 100 years old. And they've been, Sarah's 90, they, and they've been together now, uh, most commentators think about 20 years is the age of Isaac. I always kind of pictured him being three or four dawdling around with Abraham, but this is a 20-year-old man. He has the blessing of his son. And you just kind of are ready now to watch the curtain go down on Abraham's life in Genesis. And let's start the next season, season of watching God's faithfulness unfold now with the life of of Isaac. Yet we have this chapter before that. Genesis 22. God is going to give Abraham now this really tough test. Probably the hardest test that could have been given to Abraham. <coughs> this would bring his reasoning again to meet with the promise of God who has made a covenant in the fulfillment of, of what is now in his home, his son. And there's something that, that would endanger this now. And it would take away this old saint's faith and the promise that he has received. This would be as hard, I would think maybe even harder, than the promise, Abraham, you're going to have a son when you're 100 and your wife is 90. That's a difficult promise. There was such difficulty in the things against reason when you're 100 years old. And, and, and he, all he had was the bare promise of God. And what does he do? He doesn't try to figure it out on his own, his own reasoning. In Genesis 15, 6, he believed God. And he believed that God could do what he said, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Well, now he has the miracle child. I imagine it's been an amazing 20 years with this lad marveling at the goodness and kindness and faithfulness of God. To, to wait a hundred years to have your kid, I, I guarantee you he's spoiled. Okay, and this is, this is the, the treasure of his heart. And so is, is anything too difficult for God? Every time you look at Isaac, it just preaches the faithfulness of God. And so I want you to look at the test this morning, and I hope that we will see the fullness and the beauty of this passage, it's just truly amazing. It's probably the, the most famous section of all of Abraham's life. It's just an amazing story, and it's a scene that it's so moving in its character uh, that much art <coughs> and drama uh, comes from this chapter of Scripture. This is truly the high point of Abraham's life. So let's watch and see what the Lord has done in Abraham's heart over the years. And this is what I pray that he'll do in mine and he'll do in all of yours as well. I, I desire for us to grow and mature like we will see today. That no matter what comes up against the promise of God, the difficulty from the scene in life of how God will fulfill his word, that we would trust in the bare character of God and that we would believe the gospel of Jesus Christ no matter what comes up against our lives. And so many of you, I'm watching you do that. And no matter what you're facing this morning, I want you to see the beauty of faith and looking to your God. And so with that, I want to challenge one of the more popular ways of really looking at this section of Scripture. I think it's important to not miss all that's going on here. And it looks like the most popular interpretation that I could find over the years is that the story is teaching that no matter how crazy or nuts it appears what God is asking you to do, you just do it. This is nothing more than just a moral story. And if we want to become great men and women like, like Abraham, we just need to obey any crazy command. <clears throat> if God tells you to kill your only son, by golly, you do it. And that would make my kids a little bit nervous. <laughs> This story has got to rise above that. 
And I think there's more going on in this story than that. And so I want you to come with me this morning to what I think is pure gold and see what God would have for us at the table this morning. And so we're going to look at this like the drama that it is. And I see four scenes or four acts to make up this play in God's history of redemption. Sorry, my cold has just not healed. I still got a sinus infection and we're going to have to fight through this. So any good brother or sister, pray for your pastor to get through this. Our outline is in verses 1 through 2. Abraham's going to receive a test. And in verses 3 through 6, then there'll, there'll be his response to it. And in verses 7 through 14, we're going to see God's provision. And then in verses 15 through 18, I want to look at God's picture of this whole section. So if you'll come with me to the first scene, the first act, in verses 1 through 2. <clears throat> now it came about after these things <clears throat> that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. And so there's been a real movement in the last 30 years uh, to better understand this passage and, and all the critical commentaries. And I, I like the old paths. I, I love to stay there. But if there's some growing understanding in Scripture and conservative thought, I think we should look at it. And I think that's very important in this passage. And what they drew, drew out is what I like is God does not say to Abraham, Abraham, kill your son. That is an outlandish request that cults and all kinds of evil have come out of this interpretation. So if God says, kill your son, just do it. No, the, the Abraham, the call to Abraham is, I want you to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. This is not just willy-nilly some crazy command, Abraham, go kill your son. Okay, I'll do it because God said it. There's more to it than that going on. And the great scholar that I was studying this week brought much clarity that we have to understand the thinking about a firstborn son. And the ancient culture, it's very different than it is today because today we're so individualistic. It's not that uh, um, this individ individualistic prosperity that every one of us seek, but in that day it was the family's prosperity that was the focus of the culture. There was even a law of the day that the oldest son would get all of the inheritance. Because if you had a certain amount of land and wealth, let's say, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> let's say you have 10 kids. For some of you, that's going to be easy. Divide your land and property 10 ways and you're going to lose your status immediately in the culture. And so the firstborn got it all and he would be the benefactor to the rest of the family. And that's how you kept building family wealth. And so there was this whole system uh, where they would lay down their own firstborn. God would say again and again, the life of the firstborn are mine. The life of the cattle or the grain, the life of the firstborn. In Egypt, when the plagues came in judgment, it was the death of the firstborn. And so the debt of sin that every family would owe would be their firstborn. <clears throat> and they would consecrate it to God. So when God said to Abraham, go offer your firstborn as a burnt offering, it's not outlandish or out of place. I am a God of justice, and the debt that all families owe then would be the firstborn. Offer up your son Isaac. God is calling in the sin debt of the family. Abraham is being torn apart. There's pain and there's agony. In Hebrews 11, he's called to sacrifice his only son, and it says through Isaac, the world would be blessed. So here's that son. Here's the promise of blessing. And so this is big. This is huge. What's going on here? Go offer up that child where I will bless the nations. Go sacrifice him as a burnt offering. So here's the dilemma that we have seen a few times in Genesis already. The command of God is just. He's calling for a sin sacrifice for the family. And, and that's a just thing. Yet, it contradicts the promise of God that through Isaac, I'm going to bless the world. I'm going to be gracious to all who will come through this seed. So now you've got a just God calling in a, a debt, a burnt offering, and yet He's saying, offer up 
the, the, the one through whom the promise is going to come. How can God, God call in the debt of sin, the burnt offering through Isaac, and then say that the world will be blessed through him? How is this going to happen? <clears throat> this is like saying, I will bless the world through your seed, the father of nations, and you don't have any kids and you're 90 years old. How is that ever going to happen? And the answer is God. Abraham experienced the miraculous way that God fulfilled that promise that completely contradicted nature. And now a just God is demanding a sacrifice, saying of the one, the blessing will come through this one being sacrificed. <coughs> Sorry. So the faith of Abraham is to trust now in a God who can do whatever he wants. And so this little scene is the dilemma of human history. In one chapter, this is the problem forever. How can a just God be gracious to sinners? That's the dilemma that we have before us. How can a holy God be gracious? How can a gracious God be holy? How can he be just and the justifier of the sinner? How can he be a God of justice and a God of gracious promise? And the answer to this is really what the Reformation was built on 500 years ago. The answer to this question sent me on a quest that, en that ended in the answer that we're going to look at this morning. God is going to have to find a way. And that truly is, is the Bible in a nutshell. How can God be holy and just and merciful to sinners as we sit here this morning, and, and I hope that you see this, and I hope that every one of you have been on a quest to find this answer in your own life. How can God be just because he must punish my sin? And how can he be merciful and gracious to pardon and forgive my sin? So I want you to look with me at the test. The test in verses 1 through 2, it was very purposeful. He told this, this is to reveal the quality of Abraham's faith and really the same for us as God brings testing. Do we really believe the promise of God? Do we really believe that the fulfillment of what God will do and tests prove it? There's a time when, when taking more notes is not going to get it done. When more study isn't going to fix it, what is needed is a test to bring about this growing of faith and the trust and confidence of the promise of God. The word test in Hebrew meant to discover the quality of someone or something with some stress. And so here is going to be this testing of Abraham's faith. And, and we've watched him journey. And now God is going to put it to the test. Here's the promise. I want you to go offer it as a burnt offering. It's a personal test as well. He says, uh, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. So a very personal it's painful. He said, take your son, your only son whom you love. This is repeated a couple times in this text the exact same way. Take your son, your only son whom you love. <clears throat> the child at the center of your affections. This, this is painful. This is relationship. There's something special going on. Take that son, that only son whom you love. And I want you to offer him up as a burnt offering. We're blessed by knowing right out of the gate what Abraham didn't know. We know so much more. Abraham knew nothing at this point. All he knew is that he had to go as a, offer his son up as a burnt offering. This is a painful test beyond comprehension, really, of what is being asked of Abraham. And it's perplexing. Because in Genesis 17, 19, he said, No, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And so justice and promise, it's perplexing now. It had to be perplexing, but he has matured in his faith and his trust that he will handle this test beautifully because it doesn't make any sense. It's perplexing. And some of you are sitting in that place this morning in life and it's perplexing. And we got to come and we got to look and lift our eyes up again to this faithful God and what he's doing and how he's working out his promises and his fulfillments. So there's the, the test. 
I want you to look with me in verses 3 through 6 at the response. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering. And he rose and he went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go yonder and we will worship and return to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. I want you to notice the response is immediate. In verse three, he got up early that next morning and he went. Delayed obedience is no obedience. Abraham responded immediately by faith. He was steadfast. It was a three day journey and he just kept going to the place. He started the journey he arrived at his def- destination. He persevered under difficulty, confusion, and not understanding all the way. And he persevered in it. And there's a picture, I think, for all of us as we, we persevere without the full understanding, just the command of God. And fifthly, it was worshipful. He says, we're, we're going to go worship. This is so beautiful that, that the one that I really want you to get is that we can worship God in the middle of these tests. If I know this God... I can worship him in the middle of his testing and what he's doing and what he's preparing. There is a way in the gospel of Jesus Christ to worship him with what he's bringing into your life right now and testing and growing and confirming and and centering that faith. Fernando Ortega wrote in that song, When dark trials come and my heart is filled with the weight of doubt, I will praise him still. Ephesians 5.20, Paul said, Always giving thanks. There's a way to worship this God because trials give you more of God. There is a way to be joyful and to worship in the testing and to keep worshiping this God when it's hurting on every direction. There is a way to have joy. Faith. Abraham says, we'll be be right back. That's kind of interesting. I'm going to go offer up my son and and it's just him and his son. And he says, "We, we will be right back. Abraham believed if he killed Isaac... <clears throat> that God would raise him from the dead because he promised and made an oath and a covenant to bless the nations through Isaac. How do I know that? In Hebrews 11, he considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead from which he also received him back, Isaac, as a type. Now he just told you Isaac is typology. He's picturing something bigger. And Abraham knew that God would just raise him from the dead because he's got to fulfill his promise. He said through Isaac, there's just solid faith. Look at this God-centered trust with me in verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he laid it on Isaac his son, and he took it in his hand with the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked on together. So Isaac is now carrying the wood. Uh, The father has the, the fire and the knife is what he would carry. And then all of a sudden in verse 7, Isaac spoke up to Abraham his father, And said, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? I don't know if he was getting nervous or what. All of a sudden, we're going to offer up a lamb. We're going to sacrifice, and I just don't see one. And so he's wondering, where's the lamb? Verse 8. So Abraham said, God will provide Jehovah Jireh for himself. The lamb. He's going to provide it for himself. The lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And so the two of them walked on together. God will provide himself the lamb. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah means I am the the self-existent one. The self-sustaining one. So God is self-contained in his own self-sufficiency. So all of creation finds its dependency on him. Jehovah, that God. Jireh, which means to see which has the implication, Jehovah will see to it. Jehovah will provide. This self-sufficient one will bring about what we need. And the million-dollar question is, where is the lamb then for the sacrifice? How will God provide the lamb for the sacrifice? When he delivered Israel from Egypt, he provided a Passover lamb. When he established his people at the very center of the people was a sacrificial lamb that was slain for the forgiveness of their sins. 
God fixes his people's eyes throughout the Old Testament on a lamb. In Isaiah 53, he tells them the lamb that will come and will, will shed his blood and, and die for the people. They'll look forward to the lamb who would save God's people. That was the focus of Israel. So where now is the lamb for the sacrifice? That's been the question throughout Israel's history, and that was the question of Isaac. And then one day, as they're waiting and looking, John saw him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But this day, Abraham knew not. He knew that God would just provide a sacrifice. And look with me in verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. So faith doesn't pull up short. It doesn't stop at the 10 yard line. He's going to go all the way. And I see Isaac's trust is amazing because Isaac is 20 years old, which means Abraham's 120. When I was 20, I think I could have taken my dad. And he's 120 years old. And I guarantee you he could have taken his dad. And so Isaac is willful. He's willful in the sacrifice. And Abraham was unwaveringly faithful. He's ready to plunge the knife right through the heart of his son because of his faith and his trust completely in God not understanding all the way, knowing he could raise him from the dead. He, all he knew is, I'm going to be faithful because I trust God. It's unbelievable how much this man has matured and the faith that is going on. And he was ready to plunge that. His faith was in God, who would figure out how to be just and gracious at the same time to fulfill his gracious promise that he had made to Abraham. So look with me in verse 10. So he stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord, which throughout the Old Testament, uh, we're going to see that that's Jesus. That's a pre-incarnate Jesus. The, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And then Abraham raised his eyes and he looked and beheld, behold, behind him a ram was caught in the thicket by his thorns, his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Jehovah Jireh. And so please don't miss the answer. It's not Abraham saying, I will provide the sacrifice. But God, Jehovah Jireh, saying, I will provide the sacrifice. And I pray there's no one in here trying to provide the sacrifice to get yourself acceptable to God. This gospel is God says, I will provide the sacrifice. It's not your provision. God will have to find some way to give a sacrifice that will settle his justice and how to bless the guilty sinner with the gracious blessing and provision for all of eternity. Truly, Abraham's lamb could not have paid the price for his family. Isaac, the firstborn to be sacrificed. That couldn't have done it. So there's a ram in a thicket but the blood of bulls and goats cannot remove sin. It cannot truly fix the problem. It was just a great type, a picture of a lamb that would come. And so the question is, why did Abraham not have to drive the sword in the chest of his only son, his beloved son? Why did he not have to drive that through the heart of Isaac? My question is, why could God say stop? Why could God say stop? To Abraham. And that's the picture I want you to see in verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. 
and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. It's pretty interesting that Mount Moriah is where Jerusalem was built. And only God can paint these kind of pictures in real history. Let it take your breath away. A God who can paint a portrait like this. And 2,000 years later, God took his one and only son up into that mountain. And he put the wood on his shoulders again. And he would carry his cross up to Moriah, which is Calvary. And the father would carry the fire and the knife. And they would get to the top. And this time there would not be an angel of the Lord saying, stop. Now I know that you love me. This time, this father would take the sword of justice and the fires of his own wrath and he, he would pour them out on his own son. No, no one would stop this father. And God the Father poured it out on his own son, his only son whom he loved. Romans 8, 32, who, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. There was no one that said stop. And the father plunged the sword of justice through his own son's heart. He would not stop. There would not be a ram in a thicket. He would be the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This would be the one that they had been waiting for for all of the history. This is Jehovah Jireh at his very, very best. I will provide a lamb for myself. I will provide the lamb this time. And this time it would be my only begotten son, my beloved son. This was the sacrifice that Israel had been looking for for all their days. And this was the answer to Abraham's dilemma. How can God be just? How can he righteously require the sin offering of my firstborn, yet promise to bless me through this seed? And you'll notice in Genesis, the seed is singular, he says. The seed that he will bless you through is singular, not plural. It is through the seed of Jesus Christ. The one who would come from the line of Abraham, he would receive the justice of God hanging on a cross for our iniquities. And in him now, God can bless the nations of all who have faith in the Son of God. Everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord, who will believe, who will look to him, will find this salvation and will find the gracious provision of Almighty God. What a fulfillment. God can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ Jesus. My friends, that is what the table of the Lord declares to us this morning. The wonderful cross where I get a sense of how much I owe and a sense of how much God loves me. I love what God said to Abraham. Now I know how much you fear me or love me because you have done this thing by not withholding your only son from me. And so I want you to look at Christ this morning and say, now I know how much you love me, Father, because you gave your only son for me so that you could be just and you could be gracious to sinners like you and me this morning. Isn't this amazing what God painted a portrait 2,000 years before in Genesis 22. To God be the glory. Let's pray. Father, I marvel at the picture that you painted so much earlier on the exact same ground that Jesus would go up and be crucified. And I thank you that you've told us it was a type and I thank you that what we see is uh, the, the answer to our dilemma. How you can be just and justify the ungodly. So God, the, the cross is where justice and love meet and kiss. I thank you for this, Christ. I thank you that you didn't spare your only son. God, how could you have done such a thing but in love? In love and goodness, you drove that knife 
right through his heart. You brought the fires of your wrath upon your own son as our iniquity was imputed upon him. God, I thank you for the, the, willful, the willful sacrifice of our Isaac, of our sacrifice. God, I thank you that he took that cross and he, he went up that hill willfully to die upon it for his bride, to glorify his father. And so, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful picture. And I thank you that you have the right to require the death of the soul that sins. God, how can you be just and then forgive and show mercy to your people? And so we remember again this morning, Jesus Christ. We look to him as our remedy. We look to him as our life. God, now we know how much you love us as we gaze at the cross. So I pray for those who are suffering deeply. I pray, God, as they might be doubting even your love, that this morning they would look at that cross again and they would see how much you love them. God, let it fill their hearts. Let it heal their wounds. Lord, we thank you for the beauty and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious sweet name that we do pray. Amen.